Coming up on Global Business, a stronger voice. The head of the International Monetary Fund signals support for reforms that would give China more voting power within the organization. SME Bounce Back, a benchmark tracking the development of China's small and medium-sized enterprises, hit a near two-year high in the third quarter of this year as policy support measures feed through to the real economy. And investing in China. More than 400 multinational companies take part in the Qingdao Multinational Summit in East China with the digital economy and low-carbon development in the spotlight. And welcome everyone to Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michael Wong in Beijing. Well, the International Monetary Fund said in its latest Global Financial Stability Report that global risks remain fairly elevated. The report warns that a resumption of stagflation, where output and investment slows while job losses and interest rates remain high, could put significant pressure on the banking sector. The warning was based on a new, tougher global stress test that the IMF applied to around 900 banks earlier this year. It identifies around 5% of lenders are vulnerable to stress. A further 30% of banks would be vulnerable if the global economy enters a period of stagflation. The IMF urges central banks to stick with higher rates until they see evidence of inflation moving sustainably towards targets. Meanwhile, the head of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, has expressed support for giving China more voting power within the fund when interviewed by the Financial Times. Ms. Georgieva called for the IMF to better represent changes in the global economy over the past decade, which include the rise of China. She noted the disparity between China's 6% share of voting power in the IMF and its heft in the global economy, which is roughly three times as much. The voting power is determined by an IMF quota system based on the economic size of its member countries. Now, if these reforms are approved, it would signify a substantial shift in the power dynamics within the IMF. Well, the IMF also released its latest World Economic Outlook. The fund left its global growth forecast for this year unchanged at 3%. So for more on the global economy, I want to bring in Kevin Chen, Chief Economist and Chief Investment Officer at Horizon Financial Holdings. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us on the program. So the latest World Economic Outlook, Kevin, by the IMF notes that a full recovery toward pre-pandemic trends that appears increasingly out of reach, according to the fund, especially in emerging and developing economies. What's your take on this assessment by the IMF? And what do we need to see uh, a more coordinated response at the global level to really get growth back on track? What do we need to see? Hi, uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here. Uh, so I think what IMF uh, said is really just acknowledging a fact, which is that global economy is slowing down. Uh, in fact, uh, we know that right now Germany, the largest economy in European Union, is already in recession. So global economy, uh, I would say emerging markets, frontier countries, all I would say are facing, uh, you know, slowing down. And I don't think uh, people are, uh, should expect a full recovery in the near future. In fact, uh, if you look at the European Central Bank's uh, view, they are looking at 2025 as a timeline for the full recovery. So another two years of uh, slowing down ahead of us. So that's, I think, what IMF is saying is exactly the fact, yeah. Right, so we are expecting a slowdown over in Europe. The IMF, of course, voicing its concerns about emerging and developing economies throughout that latest uh, World Economic Outlook. We are likely going to see slower growth in advanced economies. We're likely going to see higher for longer interest rates in advanced economies as well. How do you see all of this impacting the more vulnerable economies of the world? I think the, the, the more vulnerable economies in the world are likely to suffer more. The reason is really, you know, there are many reasons. I would say uh, one of the um, top reasons is the extreme high uh, interest rate. The U.S. has increased, the Fed has increased interest rate uh, 11 times uh, since early last year. The European Union, ECB increased the rate, uh, Bank of England, um, Bank of Canada. I would say the global, um, uh, you know, increase of interest rate really hurt the emerging market economy more. 
because the higher interest rate in the U.S. and other countries attract capital. So the capital right now is is actually um, you know floating out 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 of the European uh, out of the emerging market countries into the developed economy, which is not the I would say a typical situation. In a normal economy, you see capital actually flow uh, flow into the uh, emerging markets. Right now, the emerging market is facing capital um, outflow and also higher interest rate, higher financing cost. And in, I would say, in addition, uh, because of slowing down, the demand is slowing down. So there's actually less of buying from the developed economy uh, you know, to the uh, emerging markets economy. So I would say, yeah, the emerging market economies right now, they are suffering a multiple fronts. Yeah. yeah, so higher cost of raising capital as well. We've got uh, weak external demand, a lot of headwinds facing emerging and developing economies. Kevin, we were just reporting uh, the managing director of the IMF, Ms. Georgieva, signaling that she supports reforms that would give China more voting rights in the fund. What does a larger voting share for China, you think, mean for the IMF's ability to really marshal more resources to support the global economy? I think this is a very good idea. I actually personally am a member of the Britain Woods Committee, and Britain Woods uh, system, you know, which includes uh, IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization, they all originally originated uh, right after World War II. Uh, actually, right now, 77 years ago, when the system was created, the economy, uh, global economic landscape, was very, very different. China was tiny economy at that time. So now uh, China is second largest economy in the world. The uh, voting power, in fact, should be higher within IMF, which actually would, uh, you know, if the uh, voting rights uh, uh, percentage of uh, from China is increased, that would increase the capital contribution from China to the IMF. That would actually translate more development uh, help to the world economy, in particular the emerging market economies. And I would say, yeah, this, you know, this proposal is right on the money to increase the participation of China, to uh, realign the, I would say, the, uh, you know, the newer economic landscape now versus 77 years ago. Okay, we're gonna leave it there. Many thanks for your thoughts on all of this, Kevin. Kevin Chen, Chief Economist and Chief Investment Officer at Horizon Financial Holdings. Thanks, Kevin. In other headlines, we're tracking around the world at this hour. Malaysia is planning to cut subsidies for the well-off and provide cash aid for the needy in its budget plan for the next year. The smaller spending plan will prioritize support for low-income households. Inflation in India eased to 5.5% in September from 6.83% in August. Cooling food prices and subsidies from the government helped offset the pressure from surging crude prices. And grocery inflation over in the United Kingdom eased with historic 15-month low of 11% during the four weeks to October 1st. That decline provided more relief for shoppers hurt by soaring prices. And up next, here on Global Business. SME bounce back, a benchmark tracking the development of China's small and medium-sized enterprises hit a near two-year high in Q3 of this year as the accumulation of policy support measures start to feed through to the real economy. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business. Only on CGTN. Well, China's small and medium-sized enterprise development index rebounded in the third quarter as policy measures start to take effect. According to data released by the China Association of SMEs on Monday, the SME development index rose to 89.2. That's close to a two-year high. The sub-index reflecting business confidence rose the most, indicating that private enterprises' development confidence has strengthened. 
The index also showed that the willingness of SMEs to invest has increased and market expectations have gradually recovered. Meanwhile, the proportion of companies operating at full capacity also rose. Well, five years have passed since China unveiled its plan to transform Hainan province into a free trade port. Yangpu, a pioneer demonstration zone of Hainan, has attracted a number of investors with the FTP's policies, including a 30% duty-free exemption for value-added processing. Our Lin Wu reports. At the end of August this year, Shangdao Hainan Supply Chain Management Company successfully cleared customs at Yangpu Port for its processed and value-added Spanish ham products. These products were eligible for a 25% import tariff exemption after undergoing over 30% value-added processing, thanks to Hainan's favorable policies. As a result, the cost of these products is 7% to 8% lower than the import costs in the Chinese mainland. The exception of tariffs for imported goods after value-added processing is very beneficial. It allows us to pass on a portion of the profits to consumers, giving us a competitive advantage in capturing a larger market share. On September 14th, a shipment of 700 kilograms of processed beef for use in hot pots, produced by Hainan Yangpu Shunying Food Camp Limited, together with Tianjiao and Luqiao groups, was transported to Shanghai and other locations from Haikou. This batch of beef also benefited from the tariff-free policy. We will import more beef products from Brazil and Argentina in large quantities, then process them here to enjoy the 12% tariff. Nine companies have already benefited from preferential policies in Yangpu, and more companies are expected to enjoy these benefits in Hainan in the future. This policy is available to enterprises engaged in food processing, new material manufacturing, jewelry and other encouraged industries. We have collaborated with customs and other departments to guide and serve enterprises in using this policy. Since this policy was implemented in Yangpu in July 2021, as of June 30th this year, Goods worth over 460 million U.S. dollars were exempted with approximately 42 million U.S. dollars in taxes. Lin Wu, Sansha Satellite TV in Hainan for CGTN. All Chinese leaders have consistently emphasized the need for continued economic openness and an improved business climate to attract foreign investment in recent months. CGTN's Michelle Vandenberg spoke to Roberta Lipson, the founder of United Family Healthcare, Vice Chair of the American Chamber of Commerce in China and Director of the U.S.-China Business Council to discuss the current private sector business environment in China. Now, in her over 40 years of living and working in China, Lipson shared her thoughts on the transformations she's observed. Take a look. I've had the amazing privilege of being able to witness um, China's growth economically, socially over the last 40 years. Every growth story has its ups and downs, but the general trajectory over these 40 years have been an impressive story of improvement and development. And I think we're in a period of a bit of challenge now, but I think there's still a great runway for continued growth for China. You're the director of the U.S.-China Business Council and also vice chairman of the AmCham. How would you say China's business environment is like right now? The foreign invested companies do have their concerns, and I think those concerns stem to a certain extent from the challenges in the geopolitical environment as a whole. Uh, but that, that confidence is being bolstered by, number one, the Chinese government's show of concern and some recent policies that have been implemented that really do show support for the private sector and do show support for um, foreign invested companies, and as well as the improvement in the U.S.-China geopolitical uh, bipartisan relationship. I think that helps a lot to bolster the confidence of our foreign companies. Uh, we've also seen increased visits by CEOs mm -hmm. of the multinationals, uh, and coming seeing is believing. There's been a lot of um, secondhand information that uh, has hurt the confidence of boards of uh, the Fortune 500 companies. 
And the fact that the CEOs and boards are starting to visit again will uh, restore that confidence to a certain extent. The medical sector is part of China's services industry, and the services industry contributes more and more to China's economic growth. Do you see a change in China's consumption pattern? Consumption patterns have very much changed. Mm -hmm. um, people looking for more improvement in the quality of their life, more ex experience, um, rather than um, buying things. Bu buying things, yes. Yeah. And do you think uh, the, the spending power is still there in China? If I take our um, business as uh, as a clue to that, um, very clearly, people, um, the spending power is there. When we opened our first hospital, most of our patients were expatriates, were people in the international community, be they diplomats or business people. Um, but now, uh, over 80% of our patients are Chinese. Uh, so more and more Chinese people are, number one, being able to afford uh, to make choices in their health care, and of course also um, prioritizing that as, as where they would like to spend their money. So uh, yes, I think there is still plenty of spending power. What's your future expansion and investment plans in China? Our next big plan is to build a comprehensive medical center that includes not only clinical care, um, preventive care, but also deep clinical care for um, all of the uh, difficult to cure illnesses. Uh, but using the most modern technology and cooperating, collaborating with some of the best hospitals in the world um, here in Beijing. And we also, it will be a center that will be able to do um, translational uh, research. That means bring the newest technologies for curing diseases to our patients, as well as making it a training center for the next generation of clinical workers in China. Meanwhile, the Qingdao Multinational Summit is underway in the eastern Chinese coastal city. More than 400 multinational corporations are taking part in the three-day summit. About one-third are attending for the first time this year. The summit focuses on six major topics, including foreign investment in China, the digital economy, and low-carbon development. There will also be a series of symposiums, closed-door meetings, and promotions. China's Commerce Ministry will meet with leaders of multinational corporations to discuss China's new foreign investment policies and answer questions. In addition, an exhibition showcasing multinationals' localization here in China will take place as well. Data shows that almost 200 projects worth about 10 billion U.S. dollars have been signed during the prior three editions of the summit. Well, China issued a document outlining 24 policy measures in August aimed at improving the business environment and attracting more foreign investment. The document deals with issues that concern foreign investors. Our Timothy Pope spoke with Eric Jung, a president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, about this and more. Eric Jung, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Looking at, at some of those opinions on further optimizing the foreign investment environment and increasing foreign investment, uh, some of them are quite thorny issues, though, including things like cross-border data transmission, fair competition. How far do they go in terms of really boosting confidence? Yeah, I think the Chinese side uh, is trying hard uh, to uh, work with foreign investors. Uh, certainly in the past, uh, we've also raised uh, issues such as market access, uh, national treatment, uh, IP protection, and, and those issues uh, are real for, for businesses to operate here. So I think uh, uh, the Chinese side realize that and they are trying to deal with some of these issues to improve uh, uh, investment climate uh, generally speaking and, and we're very happy to see the uh, State Council's uh, recent announcement uh, on the, these 24 point opinions on some of these key issues that we raised a and those are very very uh, timely opinions in our views and, and there's one deliverable already is the related to uh, tax treatment for expatriates here, their housing and their uh, kids' education and so forth. 
uh, will be dealt with in a more friendly way. So I think uh, the Chinese side are making progress to address some of our concerns. In Washington, we hear a somewhat official adoption of the term de-risking when it comes to China. Uh, this has not just been thrown around in the US, of course, also we've seen it in Europe. What does US-China de-risking actually mean? We're focusing on commercial issues, de-risking meaning diversifying our global supply chains. Uh, in the past, because China was really very competitive in terms of, of its manufacturing, and, and we tend to focus more on this market by having our supply chains concentrating in this market. And what happened with the, the trade war, the tariffs, uh, that really disrupted our supply chains. So companies are beginning to address that concern by diversifying their strategy. Uh, not leaving China though, because most companies still see China as the most competitive uh, manufacturing base. You just can't find another country that can replace China. So that's why people talk about China plus one. I mean, China continues to be the primary source of products, but you probably have one or two other alternatives just in case. They are still here. They still ch see China as a, a long-term strategic market for them. We're stepping out of the studio to take you on a brand new journey along the Belt and Road. With a mission to record how the initiative has changed lives and livelihoods. We travel to over 20 countries. We document not only infrastructure among the Belt and Road countries, but also cultural links that bound the community with a shared future. Stories of how they promote growth and improve lives. We invite you only on our special series of the New Silk Road. Well, over the past decade, 152 countries and 32 international organizations have signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, as the BRI hits its 10-year mark, CGTN's reporters have traveled to 22 Belt and Road nations across Asia, Africa, Europe, and Latin America to uncover stories of cooperation, transformation, and people-to-people -people exchanges within the framework. Now, setting off from Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province in southwest China, they headed to Bangladesh, Egypt, and Cambodia. In this episode, our reporter Ho Jing visits a cassava production plant in Thailand. The factory is equipped with innovative technology developed by a Chinese company, which enables farmers to harvest the local cash crop all year round. Cassava is known as the king of Stark. However, as fresh cassava has certain poisonous chemical, using fresh cassava for producing citric acid was only possible after three years of research and development efforts under great pressure of China investor company Kofco Ba Chemical Thailand. The technological breakthrough was then followed by more challenges, as the factory's operation was not supported by local farmers at the beginning. Farmers would complain and push the government to inspect our plant. They would say that our factory generated noisy so that they could not open the windows during the night. They said we should pay for their electricity fee because they must close the window and turn on the AC. To establish a win-win relationship, Kafko decided to directly communicate with and procure from local farmers. Our buyers have set up an online chat group with local farmers for cassava purchases. There are about a hundred members in this group. Daily purchasing price information will be posted on the board in front of our factory, as well as in the group. These cassavas were just dug out from the nearby farmland, and the farmers need to sell them to the deprocessing plant in just one or two days, or they may get rotten. Now, local farmers can sell their fresh cassava to the factory every day and receive the payment in one or two days. 
3,200 Thai baht per ton. This truck can hold three tons, and I usually sell nine tons here every day. Now, farmers not only harvest cassava during dry and cool seasons, but all year round, with Kafko as their steady procurement party. In 2022, the company acquired approximately 81,000 tons of fresh cassava, generating over 200 million Thai baht of income for nearby farmers. We are now very well acknowledged by local farmers because we have been buying fresh cassava from them. The last thing they want to know is us reducing or suspending production. Now, they may even ask for the government's help if we reduce production and cassava procurement, because it affects the selling of their harvest. The company also offers room for their Thai staff's career development. Both their professional skills and language abilities have improved during their work experience. I have worked for Kofco Biochemical for 10 years. I could not speak Chinese before, but I learned some Chinese through work. After that, I was promoted as a coordinator. I'm glad to work for our company because I can have a steady income. Now, about two-thirds of staff in Kofco Biochemical are Thai. The endeavors of Chinese, Thai staff and local farmers are also fermented like citric acid into advancement and prosperity. Ho Jing, CTTN in Raoyong, Thailand. And Thailand has been expanding cooperation with China under the Belt and Road Initiative in various fields over the past decade. Here's a recap of the outcomes achieved. Southern Road Initiative. China and Thailand are developing a comprehensive strategic cooperative partnership. China has been Thailand's largest trading partner for 10 consecutive years. In 2022, bilateral trade reached 135 billion US dollars, a year on year increase of 3%. China was also the largest source of investment in Thailand in the first half of this year, with a total investment of over 61 billion baht. With the implementation of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and the introduction of a series of trade-favorable policies, Thailand has been deepening trade ties with China, particularly in agriculture industry. China was Thailand's largest export market for durian in 2022, accounting for 96% of its total durian exports last year. In addition, Chinese tourists are providing a major boost for Thailand's tourism industry. Over 2 million Chinese tourists have visited Thailand this year as of mid-September. With the launch of the Visa Waiver Program for Chinese nationals on September 25th, the number is expected to hit 4.4 million during a five-month period. Meanwhile, the infrastructure project China-Thailand High-Speed Railway is expected to boost tourism in the two countries, lower logistics costs, and promote exports. Looking forward, the two sides plan to strengthen ties in the digital economy, especially in 5G technology application, e-commerce, and new infrastructure. Su Xinbo, CGTN, Beijing. And that's going to do it for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michael Wong here in Beijing. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next time.